Thank you very much for this very flattering introduction and for the uh, invitation, and thank you for um, coming. Um, I'd, I'd like to say um, you, you uh, almost hedged your, your, uh, introdu your formulaic introduction uh, and, and explained it, and, and I, I want to say that I'm, I'm really touched. I, I grew up in Israel, and, um, which uh, has a problematic um, history um, in, in many respects, as well as a problematic um, present situation. Um, and I wonder whether we'll ever see the day where um, events of any kind could be introduced by some kind of acknowledgement uh, that at the very least there are claims from various sides um, to, to the land um, uh, and, and so on. Uh, so I, I find that very, very touching, um, actually. And um, uh, I don't know uh, how, how uh, important uh, it is and, and, and what the meaning is really from, from a local perspective, but, but as a visitor, um, seeing that that's something that, that I, I actually find very inspiring. Um, my uh, presentation today will be on a um, project that we set up in Manchester um, a few years ago uh, to look at what is now being called uh, in increasingly um, super diversity. Um, now, we, we don't use the term super diversity in our project definition, but I mention it um, because it's um, now in, in a kind of a cross disciplinary uh, discussion context involving social linguistics and to some extent ethnography and migration studies. Um, at least in, in the European context, one comes across uh, this term um, uh, over and over again and, and, and very frequently, and um, uh, I'm not quite friendly with that concept yet because um, I've been asking um, in what way is super diversity more diverse than diversity? What, what, what are we doing? Uh, but I think in the European context, basically what it tries to um, identify is that there has been acknowledgement um, uh, in, in, in past decades already of the linguistic pluralism uh, of so-called indigenous or autochthonous populations of, of Europe um, and of the need to um, protect um, and safeguard uh, the status of regional languages such as Welsh, Frisian, um, Sami, Basque, and, and uh, many others. That is to some extent also enshrined into some uh, European procedures, not at the level of the European Union, which is the main kind of legislative and political body uh, of Europe, but rather at the level of the Council of Europe, which is more a, more a kind of a showcase human rights um, organization um, at, at European level, uh, which has a charter, European charter for regional or minority languages, which has been in place for more than 20 years now. Um, so there are various mechanisms to uh, protect and promote those languages. Uh, and I guess super diversity comes in uh, through the realization that uh, by now, we have populations who have immigrated into Europe over the past um, 40, 50, 60 years, uh, and their languages and cultures have become part of uh, Europe. And there is time to, uh, and the, there is, uh, uh, well, a good reason um, to uh, go beyond the diversity that had been acknowledged uh, of the populations that had been around for whether it's centuries or millennia, um, and also look at those populations. Languages such as Kurdish, for example, has um, upwards of, of a quarter of a million speakers. Uh, in Europe by far more than Welsh or Basque or Frisian uh, or Low German or other languages that have minority language status. Um, and especially Kurdish uh, could actually benefit um, from receiving some support uh, due to its size kind of at the European level and to, to perhaps uh, kind of offset the absence of support uh, that it's getting as a language and more generally uh, in its region of origin and, and on and on. Romani uh, is also a language that, that I've done quite a bit of work on. Um, which um, has been in Europe for many, many centuries, but because it is not the majority language in any particular region or um, attributable to any particular region, um, it uh, has not enjoyed the, the protection of most uh, mechanisms. Um, so the focus on um, super diversity is an acknowledgement, uh, not just that we have a greater number of languages uh, and of different uh, backgrounds historically, but also that we have um, situations that are constantly changing. People are moving around a lot, um, and that is, of course, the case in urban centers uh, all over the world and, and uh, not just uh, in Europe. Um, so it's that context that uh, this project tries to relate to. And, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and give you a few facts about uh, languages in Manchester uh, and give uh, a bit of a, of a feel um, of what uh, language diversity is like, how it operates, um, what is the response uh, of government and other institutions, and how do we study these responses, and what interesting lessons can we learn in terms of um, what the implications are for language policy, language planning, uh, 
um, beyond that, economic growth and development and regeneration uh, in a city like Manchester, which, as I'm sure you know, is one of the very first industrial cities, um, but lost its industry in the 1970s and 80s, went into a, a very, very deep crisis, um, and has since the uh, late 1980s trying to kind of regenerate um, the city. Uh, and capitalizing on its diversity, cultural and, and linguistic diversity, is a very central part uh, of that regeneration. So there's almost a kind of utilitarian uh, issue here in terms of the uh, uh, languages as an instrument potentially for uh, economic growth. Uh, and toward the end, um, I'll um, share uh, a little bit um, of information about how the project is organized uh, and how we see this as an um, engagement that actually redefines uh, to some extent, the role of, of universities um, as uh, leading from, from, from universities as a place of inquiry uh, to a place of potentially agency. So where your universities, higher education institutions are actually participants potentially in um, supporting, um, in this case, language diversity and awareness of language diversity and, and not just um, observers uh, of, the pro of the process. Um, I suppose a kind of epistemology that could be related to some of the activities that I know that some of you are involved in in uh, looking at um, Australian languages and of course elsewhere in the in the world. Uh, so just a couple of facts on multilingualism in language in Manchester. We estimate so we kind of in our projects that about 40 to 50 percent of adults in Manchester are multilingual. That includes those who are English speakers who have learned foreign languages, um, but mainly those who have another language in the home. It's very difficult to put a um, direct number um, on it. Now, that might seem trivial uh, to you living in a, a place like, like Brisbane, uh, perhaps, um, but you must remember that um, the, the UK and England in particular still very much has a monolingual mindset. So this uh, idea that uh, the same language has been there for centuries and some people think it's been there for millennia. Of course, it, it, it hasn't, well, uh, uh, yeah, 1,500 years or so. Um, uh, and there were other languages, and there are other languages uh, around, but, but by and large, uh, there's this kind of monolingual uh, mindset still present. So it is actually quite a, a staggering um, number. On the census of uh, 2011, which was the first census to actually ask about languages, and I'll come back to that in a moment, uh, in Manchester, around 20%, just less than 20%, declared their main language to be a language other than English. So you see that there's quite a gap there, uh, and that we very much believe that uh, that um, number is underreported. Uh, and of course, there's this ambiguity of what does main language mean. I'll, I'll come back to that um, in a moment. Uh, the principal languages numerically other than English that are represented in Manchester are these. Um, and you see they come from different parts um, of, the, uh, of the world, the South Asian languages, immigrants who came in um, just uh, after the, um, well, with the decline of the empire and from, from Commonwealth or former Commonwealth countries, um, East Asian languages, um, but also Middle Eastern um, uh, languages, uh, African languages, and through the expansion of the European Union, over the past decade and a half or so, increasingly also Central and Eastern European languages, of which Polish uh, is the largest. Uh, and in fact, Polish is now the second language uh, in the UK in general, so there are more speakers of Polish than speakers of Welsh. Uh, just over half a million were recorded as um, main language speakers by the um, census in 2011. Um, very hard to put a number on languages. Roughly between 150 and 200 languages are spoken in Manchester. Now, in a pro project, like this, which uh, has high on its agenda, or we call kind of public engagement with research, um, we do a lot of, we connect a lot with media and uh, other popular uh, institutions, and media are very keen to, to quote you on a particular figure. Um, and they sometimes make it up, or sometimes they ask a question, you know, how many languages are attested in X, and you can actually count and say 153, and they say, professor said there's 153. And then somebody else comes up, you know, six months later and says, Professor said there's 200 because they see 150 to 200. And then the Daily Mail, which is the kind of tabloid, says, oh, Professor says there's been an increase of 30% <laughs> immigrants over the last six months, you know, alarm, alarm. Um, so you, you can never really get it right. Um, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that it, it's an interesting thing to reflect upon because, first of all, what is a language? And we, if we can only count languages if they are discrete entities. Uh, 
But Muslims call their language Urdu, and Hindus who speak the same language call it Hindi. Do we count those as two different languages, you know, for one? Potwari, Mirpuri, and, and so on and so forth. Um, there are other languages that are very similar that from a linguistic viewpoint could be counted as, as one language and so on. So, so what is a language is already problematic. What is a speaker of a language? If somebody has parents who speak a language and they understand it, are they a speaker or not? Do we count them or not? What is being spoken in Manchester? If somebody is in Manchester for six months speaking a language that nobody else speaks, do we count them um, or not? Um, so the quantification, of course, is, is difficult, but, but the, the pressure that we face when we publicly engage with research to give a precise number, um, because that's a soundbite, actually gives us an opportunity to raise awareness of these issues and to say how problematic they are if the reporters or the audience have the patience to actually listen to a, an, a, an answer that is not just one number or one word. Um, but um, we try to do that uh, in that way. Um, just to go back to this idea of uh, a monolingual mindset, I'd just like to bring a few quotes and kind of nonpartisan. I'm going to go through a couple of, of main parties. Um, so this is fairly recent from um, uh, a couple of years ago. This is still the um, serving uh, minister or secretary for community. So he's in charge of kind of local authorities, Eric Pickles. Um, that we've got an election coming up, so who knows. Um, but he's been in office for the last few years. And one of the things that he said uh, in, in The Sun uh, was kind of criticizing his the predecessor government, the Labour government, for spending too much money on translation. He said, in recent years, we've, been, we've seen public bodies bending over backwards to translate documents. So in other words, it's bad. It's bad to cater to make provisions for, for other languages. That's the message. We are monolingual. Uh, just to kind of balance off, this is the David Blunkett, who was Home Secretary. This goes back many years, uh, 2002. Um, he was a uh, Home Secretary for uh, Labor and said at some point that Asian immigrants should be able to speak English at home. So not immigrants should be able to speak English, which means you know people should be bilingual. It's good. Asian immigrants should be able to speak English at home. You know why not French immigrants should be able to speak English at home? Why not immigrants should be able to speak English generally? Um, so so again, basically challenging the transmission of home languages here of a particular background. Um, this is the most interesting kind of addition to the the whole thing that makes everything more colorful. This is a chap called Nigel Farage who leads the UK Independence Party, which basically wants to leave the European Union, but is mainly kind of um, engaged in a scaremongering campaign against immigration. It's not Nick Robinson. Nick Robinson is the reporter from BBC who did the interview with Nigel Farage. But in that interview, Nigel Farage says, there are entire areas in our cities where nobody speaks English. Now, that is actually factually untrue. I mean, we researched that. And there are areas in, in England and, and, and elsewhere where there are many people who are multilingual and who speak other languages in addition to English. Um, but we know of no area where nobody speaks English. Maybe a few years ago there were a few villages in Wales uh, where some people only spoke Welsh. But, but even that is probably not the case. Now, so this is at national level, very much monolingual mindset. Contrast that with a very official declaration from Manchester City Council, which is very recent. But it's not new. This, this declaration has been around for quite a few years now. Migration is a huge strength. It contributes to enhancing culture, economy, and the reputation of Manchester as an international city. Now, why does the city council care about the reputation? Um, well, because that is actually part of enhancing economy. Uh, reputation brings investment and brings people to study in the city. Um, and uh, tourism is not a huge um, thing in, the, in Manchester, but um, so reputation is, is important, and it's international reputation uh, as an international city uh, as well. Uh, and this is what I was alluding to before. Um, multiculturalism is seen as an asset, but I will, I will show that the council um, is a bit complacent with that. So the city council kind of says, yes, multiculturalism is good. We want to encourage it, but they don't really go out of their way to do very much. They leave it to the kind of organic bottom-up dynamics of voluntary sector organizations, community institutions, private companies who kind of make money as a business providing language services and so on. Now, I'm not criticizing that, but I'm saying that, that that's a statement of fact. And we've got these interesting dynamics between a top-down encouragement but no actual top-down policy which capitalizes on this kind of organic uh, dynamics. But something that shifts toward a very, very different definition 
of the value of languages and languages standing for cultures than we have at national level at the same time uh, through declarations of these national level politicians of, of uh, all parties, uh, really. And so in that sense, the dynamics of language policy, language planning, language appreciation move away from the national level of what is nation state to actually developing a kind of a civic identity. Um, and that is really the main point, I think, of that, that we have, that we make analytically and theoretically uh, arising from the observations that we have uh, in, in Manchester. This is um, going in the same direction. This is the, uh, from the website of Midas, which is the uh, Manchester Investment and Development Agency. So Manchester City Council has actually privatized its own effort to seek investment. <laughs> so while previously it was part of the City Council's job to get investors to come to Manchester, they now outsource <laughs> the work of getting investment into Manchester to a private company. Um, but that company works closely with the council and gets government support. And one of the main things that it advertises toward investment, potential investors is that we have multilingual skills in Manchester. Now sometimes they get the numbers a bit wrong and that's when they come to us and we help them and so on. And so, so, so there's an interesting cooperation there between a university that can provide intelligence on language skills uh, and an investment agency that says that language skills are one of the top five criteria that investors look for when they come to invest in, in Manchester and open a business. Now, to give, kind of give you an, an idea, we've got about 350 businesses in Manchester corporations that do deal with customer services um, and mainly towards kind of Eastern Europe and, and the Middle East. And they need people who have local knowledge because they need to um, be able to kind of work in the framework locally and, and network and so on. But they also need to know languages um, of the customer audiences. Um, so, and that is what pulls, one of the reasons that pulls um, companies to come to Manchester rather than Newcastle, uh, which doesn't have it, or London, which has it, but everything is more expensive and, and, and so on. So, so these considerations um, and languages play a role there and the need to know, therefore, and, and have information about languages is essential. So how do we gather information about language um, is uh, one of the key things that we are looking into. And this brings me back to the reliability of data that we have. This is a uh, snapshot of the question that appeared on the 2011 census. Um, question 18, what is your main language? I skipped that question when I, uh, uh, <laughs> outside of the UK I can say because you're supposed to kind of um, fill in everything and otherwise, I don't know what they do to you if you don't, if they know that you didn't, but, um, but um, here I'm safe. So I, I can tell you that I, did, I, I just thought it was a nonsense question and I didn't fill it in. Um, and I don't know how many other people um, didn't. Uh, well, we do know because we can check, you know, what is the total number of returns and how many people actually returned on that question. I don't remember. But the gap is, is several thousand people that we know did the census but skipped the question. But then we don't even know how reliable is what they actually indicated. Now, you see that um, if it's English, go to 20. If it isn't, go to 19. And 19 is how well can you speak English. Now, if we were to ask kind of how well do you speak English, it's very subjective. It really depends on what your ambitions are, what your goals, who you need to communicate with, how often, and so on. Um, so that, too, is, is, um, is problematic. But main language, what is the main language? Is it the language that you're emotionally most attached to? Is it the language that you speak best or you write best, which might not be one and the same? Is it the language that you use most hours of the day because you use it at work? Is it the language that you learn first? Is it the language that you identify with in some ideological way? Well, all of these are possible legitimate answers, and we have absolutely no way of controlling how people interpreted the question. And therefore, the data are not comparable, and we cannot really quantify the answers that we get. Um, but this is the only tool available right now um, as, as a kind of at national level as a tool uh, that um, public institutions look at when they try to assess language needs and uh, the presence of uh, languages. Um, now we know that languages are underreported. Partly we know that from direct observations. The total number of people who declared Romani to be their main language in Manchester on the census was 20 th 23. I am personally acquainted with at least 150 uh, in Manchester, um, and uh, you know, we know that there were more. There was about, um, I think, 40 people declared Yiddish to be their main language. There's about 4,000, uh, probably. Um, and so many, many people underreported, and that we know that from direct observations. 
Um, there's also overreporting. So there is one each uh, in Manchester who declared Manx and Cornish to be their main language. Now those languages, I, I, kind of, I have to be careful, I mean those languages are considered by many linguists to have been extinct and are known to be undergoing some kind of revitalization effort. I think that's a diplomatic way of, of putting it. Um, so there are people who engage with Cornish and Manx. The question is, if there's one each, you know, who do they speak to <laughs> in Manchester? Um, we actually track them down. And we track them down because if there's one person who speaks Manx and Cornish, chances are they're going to be bloggers or something. And we actually found them. Uh, so we know who they are. I can't, don't remember their names just now, but we, we, we identified them. Um, but that's a legitimate answer because to them the question meant, what, well, presumably what, what language is most important to you? Where do you put your maximum effort? Um, but it means that in terms of planning public services or population profile or understanding that, this question does not really give us an accurate understanding. So what do we do? What options do we have? Well, one thing we can do is triangulate data sets. Um, now we can do that as an as a academic institution. Um, service, public service providers don't have the time, the resources, and often not the imagination either uh, to do that. So this is where we kind of try to connect to public services. And one example is Central Manchester Hospitals. Um, this is a kind of a hospital trust that includes a cluster of um, hospitals in the center of Manchester where the population is very, very diverse. Um, they have an interpreter, an in-house interpreter service. So this is not provided top-down by the city council, but the hospital uses its own resources and it needs to plan ahead and say how much resources are they going to put aside for interpreters. Some of the interpreters are hired by the hospital and work there full-time. And of course, they need to know which ones they, which languages to prioritize. Right now, they've got about 12. Um, other, for other languages, they outsource. So they bring in agencies. But again, they need to plan ahead. They need to so, you know, find which agencies and so on. So they monitor. But they monitor mainly for financial reasons, because they have to pay somebody by the hour for interpreting, so they have to keep a record of it. They keep a record of it so we know how many requests were made in a year. We also know which ward and the date, so which hospital ward, and, and so on. And we can get to ev everything except the patient's identity. Uh, actually, we, we know quite a bit which company provided the service and so on. And we can compare the two. And of course, Manchester hospitals, you know, it, it's not a completely representative thing because it represents only a certain district within the city. And it represents only those who needed to go to hospital <laughs> during that year. So we're not expecting a perfect match, but maybe a proportional one. Where if we look at the top languages on the census, and one of them, by the way, is all other Chinese. What does that mean? Well, as a result of that um, odd question, what is your main language, some people put down Cantonese. Some people put down Mandarin. Some people just put down Chinese. And then the census people don't know what that means, Chinese. So they lump all other Chinese as Chinese. And as a result, all other Chinese actually outnumbers Mandarin and Cantonese but presumably also includes Mandarin and Cantonese as well as other Chinese languages. And therefore we have, uh, so that's kind of one of those um, oddities of the census. But you see the top languages on the census, and you see that they are pretty much kind of a match to the top languages requested in 2012 uh, in central Manchester hospitals. So, so far so good, but we don't have a perfect match if we go down um, the full list. So Greek, for example, not a huge number of speakers, but you know, one of the top 20 languages in Manchester. No request in the top 20 or 25 in Manchester hospitals. Why? This is a population of Cypriot background. They all knew English even before they came to settle in England, and they've been settled for a very long time, so there's no interpreter need. So speaking a language and identifying with it doesn't automatically mean that you need interpreters, and that's something important that our Secretary for um, Communities and so on doesn't quite understand, or he understands and polemicizes uh, as politicians do um, anyway. Uh, but that's, that's kind of a bit of information and analysis that we can provide into the public debate on these things. German, similarly, we have through EU movement and so on, people who are mainly professionals who speak German, they don't have problems with English, but they, yeah, they're very conscious of their um, first uh, home language. And then Malayalam. Um, we have many kind of South Asian languages, and many of them, some of them are kind of top on the uh, interpreter request list as well. Urdu, Bengali, Punjabi, Malayalam not. Well, Malayalam was a um, deliberate recruitment campaign for medical staff uh, 
by the National Health Service a few years ago. So these people actually, most of them actually work at the hospital. Uh, and again, they're all professionals and they know English and they know the research. So that's kind of an example that there's no perfect match. And on the other hand, we have Romanian, for example. Um, so many people, probably most of them are Romani, not Romanian, but they don't ask for a Romani translation, but for a Romanian translation because they come from Romania. Um, and um, they're not, probably they don't actually declare Romanian as their main language, or they don't fill in the census altogether. Um, or if they do, that kind of in the broader context of, of Manchester spatially, they, they don't appear as one of the top languages. But they are recent immigrants, um, they have uh, their young families, they have many children. Um, so they're kind of overrepresented proportionally, and they live in the central district, so they're overrepresented um, in that cohort. Um, and then we got a language like Tigrinya uh, with a similar story. So a young population of immigrants, refugees, many from Eritrea, um, young population, so they have children um, and uh, need the service of hospitals more often. And by contrast, we have Gujarati, which is actually an elderly population. So they've been around for a long time. They're not one of the top languages because the language is declining, not being passed on to the younger generations. But the elderly people need more care in hospitals. So again, they're overrepresented in the hospital. So again, that means that, that we cannot just take the census and plan services ahead, you know, just on the basis of one data set. We, we need the um, comparison. Um, here's another um, insight into the same set of data. This is some a selection of the interpreter requests in the same hospital clusters by department. Um, and the color codes here are, are interesting for just for a selection. So we have a whole bunch of um, languages for which we have hardly any requests at all in the cataract unit, which is usually something that caters for, for old age uh, people, whereas the very same languages are rather high proportionally uh, on maternity and pediatric, which makes sense. This is a young population. They go to hospital when they, when they have children rather than uh, other you know, illnesses or something like that. Um, this represents, the numbers represent the proportion of all the requests for that language in that ward. So 27% of Pashto requests were at maternity, in the maternity ward. Now why the Pashto people need, have maternity but don't actually need care, pediatric care, we don't know, but that's something that we, we can look at. So the data actually raise the question, we've got an anomaly there, and that's something that we can go back to the hospital and say, well, maybe you want to look at this population. And then, of course, we have the reverse. So uh, we have Gujarati, Punjabi, Hakka, Chinese, um, which have kind of very high proportion, the cataract unit representing an elderly population, and very low in maternity and pediatrics. So again, we can kind of plan ahead. And things like, you know, the role of dementia. So as people who now speak English become older, um, will they lose the ability to speak English? We, we don't really know. It's not conclusive, but that's something that um, to, to think about uh, in that respect. Uh, just a couple of more of those data tables just to kind of show you how we work. Um, one of the things we look at is city library stock and acquisitions. Again, the library they need to account um, for, for their spending. Um, and they acquire books in other languages based on requests that they get. So people say, could you buy this book in Bengali? Um, and then they buy it. So they monitor acquisitions. They also monitor every book that's issued because it's tagged for the language. And when you scan it, when you issue the book, we know how many issues there are. And this is for the city as a, as a whole, but we can break it down to neighborhood libraries as well and, and see what, what sort of requests there are. And there's a whole bunch of languages that are kind of quite healthy. So there's a high stock, large stock, many acquisitions, which means that the population actively engages with the libraries and asks them to buy books and also many issues, so they, they actually make use of it. They don't just buy, ask for the books and have them sit there, they actually use them. We've got some in between, and then we've got some that are kind of less healthy. So Kurdish, actually more acquisitions were made than issues, um, and it's a, almost a perfect match, so maybe somebody ordered 14 books and borrowed the 13 of them and forgot the other one. Um, Vietnamese, there's actually no new acquisitions at all, but people still read. This is a, a population of kind of refugees uh, from the early 1980s who still read Vietnamese. And again, as far as we're aware, it's not being passed on to the younger generation. Um, Arabic is kind of in the intermediate side, and, and there we have a population that has a lot of reading materials um, actually in other institutions outside public libraries as well. So those things need to be taken into account um, as well. Uh, local service providers are very much interested in the spatial distribution of languages. And this colorful figure um, shows the first past the post um, system. So which language other than English 
is the largest in a particular ward in the Greater Manchester area. And you see that it's quite colorful and, and uh, quite patchy, but there's a lot of presence um, of that bluish um, thing, which is Polish. So Polish is the first past the post, not because the number, well, the number is high, but because they are most dispersed. And you can see that better in this figure, where a dot represents a certain number of people. Um, and you can see that there are clusters, that many languages are clusters in, clustered in particular areas, but the poles are actually spread out um, from uh, between all poles of the map, as, as it were. So, so there's no concentration of kind of a Polish population anywhere in Manchester. So these are, again, things um, that um, we can, this is based on census figures, that we can use um, for planning uh, provisions. Uh, and this finally, this is the, the final table with numbers, um, actually shows that you can actually take various data sets and try and correlate languages by particular location. Now, um, in, in England, there's a thing called the school census. Schools have to give data on their pupils once a year, and that data includes the home language of the pupil, actually referred to as first language. Um, so again, it's a difficult concept, and it's based not on actually asking the pupils any questions, but some administrator guessing, knowing the pupils, probably they speak this language, and they put them down. Now, we, we, we actually investigated that. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, through our own census in a number of schools and found up to 30% discrepancy between our findings when we actually interviewed pupils and the information that the school had about them. But using the school census, and you can then look at schools representing particular districts in the city, and then you can correlate um, the appearance of certain languages, and you get kind of information on how likely is it that if this language is spoken in that area, then this other language is also spoken, which shows you something about settlement patterns. And as you can see, there's kind of two clusters that we've identified here. The um, um, yellow has um, South Asian languages, but also Middle Eastern languages. So Urdu, Punjabi um, are almost a perfect match, partly because many families are bilingual in those two languages. Persian, Kurdish, and Arabic. And then Somali also clusters with those languages, by and large, um, in the same areas. And this has to do, of course, with shared culture and shared institutions and so on. Um, and then there's another culture where we have Yoruba Shona. Now remember, these are languages that school administrators recognize as the first languages of pupils that they're aware of. Yoruba Shona, African languages, and then we have French and Portuguese. Now why would French and Portuguese people choose to settle specifically with Central West African people and vice versa? Well, actually what this shows us is that the teachers are not aware often of African home languages of many people from Mozambique, for example, uh, or Cameroon, and they put them down as French and Portuguese. So it actually shows that most of the numbers that represent French and Portuguese are actually African and not Europeans or, or South Americans. This is from the national census, basically the same exercise, and that is even more pronounced. So we've got more blue showing that on the national census, even more Africans underreport African languages in favor of the national colonial, ex-colonial languages. Um, there. So the point here is that with, with these figures, and, and by the way, um, people kind of in authorities, they're very impressed because they usually don't really know what linguists do. And when you show them figures and show that they give a pattern, um, but, but uh, we, we can do things and we can understand with existing data without even going out and getting new data. We can understand more um, than any one data set can provide. But this is a service that doesn't actually um, uh, take place, uh, uh, an exchange that doesn't take place because agencies don't talk to one another. Um, and here comes the role of a university, potentially, that you can actually put these data together, bring conclusions, and feed them back to the various institutions. Now, we do go um, a step beyond that and do our own data collection. And this is a school language survey that we've designed a couple of years ago and have tested by now at something like seven or eight different schools. Um, and we've now got schools actually lined up, queuing to uh, take part um, in this, and we're training students and staff to carry this on, so school staff to carry this um, survey out. And this is based on individual short interviews with pupils, where we ask them what languages they know, who they use them with, um, what their exposure is to those languages at home, for example, media and reading and films and, and so on. So we get a bit of a shortened social linguistic profile uh, of their ling language repertoires. And we then introduced a proficiency test that, is, uh, that does not actually require recording or even knowing the language. We wanted to avoid audio recording uh, 
because to do that you actually need parental consent from each and every child and that's very difficult to get. Um, so we do that just for a control sample. But for most of the kids we've, we train research assistants to ask them certain questions and estimate kind of the, 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 the pace or the hesitation, how hesitant are they or how fluent are they in providing a reply. And there's a continuum in the questions for something that's very, very simple such as um, you know, count from one to ten um, to something that is a bit more complex, tell me about name members of your family where you have to actually reflect, to tell me what you've done this morning where you actually need complete sentences. And it works because the anticipated continuum of fluency is something that we actually find confirmed, uh, which shows us that you know, it's not random, so, so our, our anticipation was also correct. Um, this is all online uh, in detail. There's a report that you can um, look at if you're interested. And um, some of the things that we found in the first cohort of something like 500 pupils that we interviewed in four different schools, primary and secondary, um, is that um, people tend to use languages other than English more with their parents than with their siblings, which is anticipated and kind of shows ongoing language shift. But the point is that they do actually also use the home language with their siblings. Um, and they do also use English with their parents, and the two are not contradictory. So people are multilingual in the home. So language maintenance is not an obstacle to learning English, but also introducing English to the home is not necessarily, uh, 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 you know, uh, basically doesn't necessarily uh, doom the home language to, to be um, forgotten completely. Um, there are different patterns of language use with the parents, and they're quite interesting. Um, Punjabi speakers, for example, as you can see, um, tend to speak Punjabi only with the weather, um, and whereas sometimes in other communities it's, it's balanced. So that's interesting. Um, but another finding, this shows the um, number of children, the proficiency score that we've given on that proficiency test that I've mentioned, where the highest possible score is 12. And it shows whether, uh, and these are all self-reported, so we ask the children, do you watch television in that home language? Do you read in the language? Are you being read to in the language? Do you see films in your language? Do you go to clubs or supplementary schools, weekend schools in the language? And there's interesting findings. Um, red means kind of lower than average. Green means higher than average. And for Arabic, for example, we've got the highest scores of watching television in Arabic, reading, being read to in Arabic, going to supplementary schools, and also a very high proficiency score. For Romani, by contrast, we find the lowest. In fact, that 3.6% uh, we think is one child who basically thought we were talking about Romanian rather than Romani. Um, so nobody watches television, nobody reads in the language, or hardly any. When they say read, some of them go to social media in Romani uh, and, and have that. But there's minimal institutional support, or actually no institutional support. And yet the proficiency score is very high for both languages. In other words, different communities have different ways of maintaining their home languages. And so there isn't necessarily the overall wisdom if you want to maintain, and I think this is a lesson to be learned beyond just Manchester, if you want to maintain your heritage language, you must write it down, or you must introduce school, or you must have films or whatever. You know, there are different ways, and it really depends on, on attitudes. Uh, I'll skip this one. Um, and what we found, by and large, which is really of interest to parents and teachers and communities, is that Home language maintenance does not have any adverse effect on proficiency in English um, because we, we tested the proficiency in English as well. Um, home language maintenance provides skills for the next generation workforce, everything that the investment agencies want, uh, and they say we need to have more international trade and therefore we need language and culture skills. If Manchester City Council were to act on that by investing in teaching languages, it would take a very long time and have a very low return, but parents do that anyway at the home and we get a resource for free, so to speak, um, maintained by communities who maintain supplementary schools and so on. Um, and also for the smaller languages, home language maintenance provides potentially also a pool of mediators, so people who can actually work in schools and support um, their own communities, even if those languages are not commercially viable as in relevant for um, larger companies. Another data set that we've been collecting comes from Twitter, um, and data that are accessible publicly, uh, we've downloaded for a certain period of time uh, and ran them through a language recognition software and then had to do some modifications to that because that doesn't completely do the work for us. 
and we can narrow them down if they have a kind of a GPS, we can narrow them down to the time and place um, where they were sent and the language. And we get some interesting patterns. Some are more meaningful than others. This is sort of the university district um, in Manchester and, and kind of the city center. Um, and this is an event that took place in a particular venue um, of the Arabic community and many people approaching and being at the event and approaching the event tweeted about it or other things in Arabic. Um, and we get other clusters. Some of it, of course, just means you know somebody stuck in a bus in a traffic jam uh, or something like that. So not everything is meaningful. Um, this is kind of a close-up of the university area. And you can see that here somebody might be in a bus, uh, but there's people kind of in individual flats tweeting in different languages, which show that kind of languages are alive uh, in various ways. And this is um, Old Trafford, which is Manchester United football stadium during a football match. And you can see that people are tweeting uh, presumably about, well, maybe about the match or not in, in various languages. Um, so these are kind of things that are perhaps entertainment value, but we, they also give us some indicator of language vitality um, uh, as, as well. There's an interesting linguistic angle. Um, if we look at a couple of languages, um, the, the history of the Chinese community in Manchester is interesting because we have an older generation who are Hakka speakers, uh, an intermediate generation that shifted to Cantonese and several supplementary schools that for a period of about 20, 30 years taught primarily in Cantonese. And this has since shifted in the last 15 years or so to Mandarin. Um, so what does this mean in terms of theorizing language maintenance? Because from generation to generation, actually, languages have been lost. And yet the community, as a community, maintains its own language. It's just a different language from one generation to another. Um, and that has to do partly with uh, immigration from different places and new opportunities um, coming up. Punjabi is another interesting case. Um, we've had among the Muslim population of Punjabi speakers a shift from the older generation who are mainly Punjabi speakers to a middle generation who uses Urdu as a community language to a younger generation brought up in English. But now a kind of a revitalization in that young generation of Punjabi, partly because these were people who as by the time they were children, their grandparents who spoke Punjabi retired and took care of them in the home. So they had more exposure to Punjabi. And then they go on social media and use Punjabi in Roman script. So they don't actually have to have any education in Punjabi, but they, they rediscover their Punjabi identity uh, and go back and, and use it very actively and become more proficient actually than their parents in, in Punjabi. And that's through no planning whatsoever. And again, lessons to be learned for you know, apps and uh, social media and whatever that might encourage people to engage with their heritage languages. And in Arabic, we have a different kind of thing. We have many, many different Arabic dialects spoken in Manchester forming an integrated community. And there's a lot of cross-dialect communication, uh, which doesn't actually happen in the Arab world. And if you talk to many experts kind of in Arabic language, they sometimes tell you, well, they, people can't communicate across dialects of Arabic. And yes, they can. Um, and whether they're creating a kind of a new Arabic lingua franca remains to be seen. We don't have any kind of evidence that that's happening. Uh, but certainly Arabic is, is becoming, as a general language, kind of part of the brand uh, of Manchester. So Manchester United also has a webpage in Arabic and, and one in Chinese uh, as well for its fans uh, um, abroad. Um, so just a few remarks about language planning and language policy in Manchester. We have very, very few, as I indicated, top-down responses. And they are mainly around the city council's commitment to ensure equal access to services. Um, but it's not usually the city council that actually puts these measures in place. Rather, they're done at local level. They're done by individual agencies. So that includes translation of information material, interpreter services in institutions, sometimes hiring multilingual staff, um, sometimes relying on multilingual volunteers. So very much an awareness that language diversity needs to be present in service provision um, in various ways. Um, but it's not planned top-down. So there's that understanding, that overall message that we saw at the beginning, it's good to have language diversity. But actually, the action that is taken is very decentralized. It's very based on the individual agencies and what they feel they need at a given time, a certain local library, a hospital, uh, a police department, and um, so on. Um, and they very much respond to the needs that arise. So somebody said, I want a book in Bengali, they order it. Somebody says, I want an interpreter for Tigrinya, they get one. So it's very much need-driven and pragmatic. Uh, and so subject to constant renewal. Uh, 
and very, very different from the kind of language planning that we find in the old concept of diversity, which says this is a region that has Welsh as part of its heritage, therefore we need a Welsh language act and resources, and we need to institutionalize Welsh in it, and so on and so forth. This is done in a very, very different um, way. Sometimes not in a very efficient way. Um, this is a leaflet that was distributed last year. Um, very typical, Manchester City Council distributes information and then says, if you want this translated, ring this number. And then it says that in different languages. But here you see languages like Vietnamese and Bosnian, um, where nobody really needs the translation, but the absence of languages like Kurdish and Polish, uh, where there is, we know, demand now. So these things are not necessarily kept up to date, because of the absence of any kind of top-down uh, policy. So it has downsides as well. Um, sometimes some things are kind of decorative, even though there is no top-down policy of multilingual. This is Manchester Airport, which has recently started to put up signs in Urdu. <laughs> so there is some kind of, uh, Urdu is the kind of highest non-English language, but there are others um, as well. Um, and we're, we're still trying to kind of figure out who's taking the decisions. That's inter an interesting ethnography, you know, who takes the decisions on these things. But there's Urdu presence here and there in different parts of the city in other city council um, information and signs, um, but it, it's kind of random. Um, this one is one of my favorites. It actually has uh, Urdu and uh, Bengali and Gujarati. Um, and the people who are actually addressees of that say it's very offending because it's considered to be a good thing to actually, you know, give to, well, in this case, pigeons, but <laughs> uh, it's kind of, in, it's, it sees, it's seen as intruding, culturally intruding, uh, in fact, and people I've interviewed about that. This is a police station in the neighborhood where I live, uh, which flags that, you know, what you need to do when the police station is closed, actually, uh, in something like 10 different languages. Um, and not because necessarily there are people who don't know English in the neighborhood, but again, it's just kind of a gesture that flags we recognize diversity and are prepared to put the effort and the cost to have it translated and display it out there. So there are these kind of individual gestures which again connect to that general statement from Manchester City Council, even though there is no structured top-down um, language policy. What there is a lot is bottom-up responses to language diversity. Um, people. Um, trade in different languages. They try to connect to particular audiences. And so that means that language becomes a business in its, in its own right. So people need somebody who can put signs up in uh, other languages, in this case Urdu, or provide satellite dishes that allow you to capture Arabic speaking satellite channels. And so the advertisement for that is done in Arabic because it's a particular niche uh, market. Um, or some people, you just get this spontaneous kind of bilingualism. Um, and we're, we're learning, we learn a lot about this kind of civic identity development through looking at linguistic landscapes, and, and that's going to be my last point. Um, now, um, we find quite a lot of um, uh, targeting particular audiences, um, saying, you know, giving various instruction messages to customer audiences in different languages, knowing that you're getting audiences from particular um, communities, uh, sometimes selecting them specifically. Um, and making an effort to do that. Now, if you know Malay, then you can read this, and this says free drinks um, for everybody from Malaysia. Um, and next to that, we have something in Russian. And what does that say? Who reads Russian? Anyone want to guess? Three drinks for Kazakhs and Uzbeks. <laughs> so somebody knows, you know, somebody knows that we have students from Central Asia who are, who, who are Russian, who read Russian. And I can pretty much guarantee that there's nobody in Manchester who speaks both Malay and Russian. Um, so somebody went into some effort studying the community, getting their needs, and attracting their attention. And why would they give them free drinks? Because then they can come and eat and pay for that. So, so it's all kind of a commercial enterprise building on that language thing. This is another case of audience selection. It says restaurant where everybody can understand, but then it says we have a separate room for families. And it says that only in Somali and in Arabic because having a family room uh, is not relevant for, for other audiences, you know, that, that are, are non-Muslim audiences. So family room is basically code for gender mixed uh, room um, as well. Um, here's another one. Um, if you don't know English, you wouldn't know who the company is or how to contact them. If you do know English, you know who the company is, but you don't know what they offer. Um, and what they offer is listed in Kurdish and in Arabic. Um, okay, so we've got a kind of a trilingual identity, but different functions. Um, and this is very, very common 
uh, in the city and in certain districts in particular. Um, and then we've got people, you know, soliciting audiences through their language. So in this case, of course, expert immigration solicitors, it's clear that they would make an effort to use different languages because that's their audience. Um, but this is less clear. This is just book a free place for a free nursery. And somebody went to probably kind of a, a Google translation. It, it's not quite perfect. But again, they made the effort. And we've got, again, we've got what we've got there, Urdu and Hindi and French um, for an African population and Arabic and Polish and Turkish and Bosnian. So again, there's nobody in the city who speaks all of these languages. And somebody made the effort to go to different um, populations. Um, on the same note, I mentioned again the, cor the correlation, the spatial correlation that we get for languages um, based on triangulating data sets. Now, it's in the bottom up dimension, we see that people actually have a realization of that reality and that correlation spatially in neighborhoods without actually studying the numbers. Um, so this is a taxi training school advertising. Now, you can't do a taxi license in Manchester if you don't know English. Um, so this is not intended to people who don't know English. It's intended to capture their attention and perhaps get them as customers. And this is it's quite a bit of a text, and it's written here in, in Arabic and Urdu and Persian and Somali. And again, there's nobody who speaks all of these languages, but they're spoken in the same area, in the same neighborhood. So somebody realizes that these are the languages in the neighborhood and that it pays to spend the money to get the translation and print it, and they're postered around. And you see that realization also on signs like, you know, welcome in exactly those same languages. Uh, Urdu, Persian has the same Somali um, and, and Arabic. Um, and this is the kind of the, the development of, of what we were calling kind of a civic identity. It's bottom up. People understand what well, we are in a multilingual reality. We use not just our home languages, but the home languages of those around us to basically embrace uh, that kind of uh, plurilingual and multicultural community. Sometimes the other language is just a luxury. It's not really needed, but it's just there uh, as an additional gesture. And this is a nice example. Uh, Kulfi ice cream and Faluda, um, but it doesn't actually advertise ice cream and Faluda in Urdu, only Kulfi. And it's not that the Urdu speakers are only offered kulfi. It's not, it's a, there's, there's not enough space on the poster. So you just do one just to grab their attention. So the other language here, the multilingualism, is an attention grabber. Um, here is similar. We've got the express cargo uh, in Arabic up here, and we've got competitive prices in Arabic. But otherwise, if you don't know Arabic, you're, if you don't know English, you're lost. And Arabic doesn't help you understand what the company has to offer. Um, and then we've got kind of language play. Uh, in itself becoming a um, part of the city's culture. So this says curry or cocktails, which means curry and cocktails. And then it says that in Hindi alphabet here. Can anybody read this? It says curry or cocktail. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, we're, we're getting kind of messages that are packed, and, and, and it's more the point of we are uh, kind of multilingual. Um, so what implications do we have? Well. Super diversity partly means that there's constant change. People move around a lot. And that means that planning has to be responsive, because you can't plan ahead 10 years because you don't know what population changes there are going to be. And that means that you need tools to monitor change, which right now most institutions don't have, or they have them ad hoc, locally based, um, but nothing kind of general. But in order to work with those tools we, need tools, we need to revise the monolingual mindset. Because if you ask questions like, what is your main language, then that doesn't help you get the data that you need. Um, and so studying multilingualism uh, and its dynamics in a super diverse environment actually informs us of what tools we need and how do we redesign the tools to get agencies and institutions to get the kind of information that they um, need. Um, we're seeing in all of this context that, that policy is following a kind of a civic identity um, thing, uh, which is bottom up and very different from the mindset of national policy, the procedures of national policy, and also the political messages that we're getting from national policy. The city is doing something different than national politicians want the country um, to do. Um, and an interesting point here, in relation to governance and perhaps the ethnography of the whole thing is that we've got a proliferation of agents. There's many, many players. First of all, every institution does its own thing. And then you've got voluntary sector organizations, community organizations, private companies offering interpreter services, uh, and so on. Um, and that means, and government is kind of in there somewhere. But really what it does, it plays an intermediary. 
okay, this is good for you, and I'll hire you to do that, and you can outsource this to them and whatever. And government is there. And rather than being the enabling agent, we plan, we carry out, we uh, you know, provide the resources and everything, which is kind of the old-fashioned um, method of, uh, or concept of standardization. Government is just a kind of, I'll bring you two together so that you can work it out um, somehow kind of thing. Um, in that, we believe that we have a role to play as a university, and we've set up the multilingual Manchester activity. Um, and uh, I might take you through a few things, but otherwise you can actually go on the website and it's sort of self-explanatory. There's reports that our students um, have done, research reports on multilingualism in Manchester under reports. Um, and there's uh, a student volunteer scheme that we've set up where volunteers actually work in the different agencies, um, assisting in outreach and raising awareness of language diversity, um, as well as uh, many other things. Um, but I'll stop there, and I, I might um, come back to, to this if we have time uh, in, in, a, in a question. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Um, I guess we'll put the floor open for um, questions for the next um, five, ten minutes. None. None. There is no use of other languages. That, that's very easy. No use of other languages in, in state schools, in mainstream schools. Uh, there are supplementary schools. I mean, there is foreign language teaching in some schools. Um, primarily uh, European languages, French and German. Um, sometimes Urdu and Chinese, but very rarely. Um, what there is is supplementary schools. Um, they are operated entirely by communities. They used to receive tokenistic funding from the council, like grants of 300 pounds, that's $600 or something a year, that's really nothing. Um, the reason for those grants were primarily for the council to be able to get applications, and then in the application the school needed to report on its activities. That gave the council the opportunity to gather information on the schools. Um, that was abolished. Those grants were abolished two years ago, so now the council has set up a gold, bronze, and silver standard. So schools can write a report about what they do and apply, and then they get a certificate, bronze, and whatever. Um, so that's a kind of a slight kind of mechanism downscaled a bit. Um, so we are now, we're now shadowing that. We've just done reports, which we're about to publish in a couple weeks' time uh, online, so you can monitor the website. Um, interviewing 25 supplementary schools and looking at how they work, what issues they face. Um, they teach in all sorts of different languages. Um, Chinese and Arabic are the biggest. Um, there's a lot of Urdu. Um, there is uh, Latvian, Japanese, really a very, very wide range. Um, it's done almost exclusively by volunteers. The larger schools, the Arabic ones, usually are able to hire staff who actually have some teaching background. Um, usually they follow the curriculum of, of one of the origin countries. Um, but by and large, they're not regulated, and they're complaining about that. So they're saying things like, um, you know, we cannot have accreditation because the inspectors can't visit us because the inspectors don't work on Sunday, and we're a Sunday school. It, it comes down to really very trivial things like that, seemingly trivial, but they are, you know, they can't, they have a lot of turnover of staff because they rely on volunteers and, and so on. Um, so, so that is something that um, there's, there is a gap there. So on the one hand, communities are doing a lot, and some of these schools have a long history of operating. Um, they are also sensitive to changing needs, and as I mentioned before, the Chinese schools used to teach in Cantonese, and now pretty much all of them in Manchester have gone over to teaching Mandarin, uh, which may not be the spoken language in the homes, but, but is the language of the schools. So they're taking their own initiative. But none of it is top-down, none of it is, is state-sponsored or state-regulated. <laughs> 
Um, we know, well, we don't have studies to, for comparison for all the languages. Um, we know for Gujarati, where um, one of our students did a study just last year, that that's not the case. So there is a grandparent generation who speaks Gujarati, but the language is not being passed on to the youngest uh, generation. Um, so there are differences there. Um, the, much of the immigration is, is recent. Many of the languages are recent. Speakers of Polish, Romanian, Romani, Arabic even, tend not to have grandparents in Manchester. Um, so the comparison basis is very, it's, it's really just the South Asian languages and Chinese uh, and Yiddish that we can compare. Yiddish is, I didn't actually talk about Yiddish, Manchester is the fourth largest Yiddish speaking community probably in the world. I'll keep saying that until somebody comes with evidence to contradict me, but uh, I, I think, you know, it's hard to kind of know exactly. Um, but uh, it's spoken exclusively within the Orthodox Jewish community. It's a very closed community. It's got its own schools and institutions. Um, and there is a growing number of speakers um, because of birth rates. You know, they have on average something like eight children per family. Um, so in the past 20 years since I've been in Manchester, there's certainly been a growth in the number of uh, Yiddish speakers in the Orthodox community. But apart from that, unfortunately, we don't really have comparative data, so I, I, I can't say. Yes. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, the discrepancy between the two arises simply from the fact that we have that discrepancy that I mentioned a couple of times between national agenda and civic agenda. And the education agenda is set, the curriculum is sent at national level. And in fact, uh, it was the Labour government that actually uh, abolished compulsory um, second language education at GCSE level. So this is about kind of GCSE exams are at the age of around uh, 11 or so before you go into secondary school. Sorry, uh, just after the age of 11, the, f the lower levels of secondary school. Um, and uh, that was abolished a few years ago. It was just reintroduced recently. But we have a huge gap there because that has a knock-on effect. Uh, a generation of pupils who do fewer GCSEs means fewer A-level, the more advanced level of secondary school means fewer people taking languages in university, means fewer teachers to then teach the GCSE when it's reintroduced 10 years later. So that's kind of irreparable damage for, for a while that was done. And it was done because they wanted, they were committed to show that they have improved education attainment statistics. And so they looked and they said, where are pupils underperforming most? And short of you can't abolish math, you can't abolish English, and <laughs> looking at everything else, the worst performance was in languages. And they said, if we abolish languages, then we can raise the attainment levels. You know, it, it's, a, it's a basically a, a numbers trick. Um, and we're paying a price um, for that now. That was done at national level. And the city doesn't have the power. Individual schools can put this on if they have the resources. But we're looking at, you know, uh, the thing is that the, the schools where we have the highest proportion of people who have a language other than English as a home language are usually the more deprived areas as well, where schools have fewer resources. Um, and the council, the city is not giving them resources to, to do that. So the city is not actually planning curriculum at all. And that's the discrepancy, really. Now, there is an initiative at national level to lobby now for uh, languages as a resource. And there's been a lot of work done by, uh, in a collaboration, interesting collaboration between the British Academy, uh, which is the, um, what's the, um, here, the kind of the Academy of Sciences um, sort of thing, but uh, for the humanities the British Academy, and the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, who basically took a joint initiative that they launched a year and a half ago to promote the study of languages. And they're looking at all sorts of languages, so not just the traditional French and English, um, but languages that are of commercial value, Portuguese, Chinese, Arabic um, in particular, but also Eastern European languages. Um, but this is then a kind of a public relations initiative, and it may take years for it to be embraced uh, 
um, by politicians who will be able to then change the curriculum again. Yes, in fact, I do for Manchester, as, as it happens, I do, because I looked this up just very recently. Um, how many are speakers of, of all the languages? I, I don't know, but Manchester City Council has about 95 um, elected councillors. Um, and of those, I recently counted 16 of Asian background. I'm assuming, I know some of them personally, and I know that they speak other languages. Um, I'm assuming that at least two-thirds of those speak Asian languages. Mainly it'll be Urdu, sometimes Potwari, perhaps also Punjabi. Um, I'm also aware of one councillor who's uh, Latvian, who was just elected a few months ago. And we're working, and why do I know? Because we've started to, <laughs> in the last few months, work specifically with those who are, um, have other home languages because they are very kind of sensitive uh, to these issues and responsive. And uh, Zizra Noor, who's the um, councillor of Latvian background, uh, actually set up a, a Latvian supplementary school and uh, was running that herself until very recently. Um, and we're planning actually a language celebration day in her ward, which is uh, Levensholm, kind of in, in Manchester in the next few months. Um, so, so in fact, yeah, that is very much kind of an opportunity to try. Uh, but it's us who are taking initiative. So us as a, as a project. It's not the councillors who so far have been taking language initiatives, nor is it any agency that says we have elected councillors who have other languages, let's let them do that. It's, it's our project who's approached them. And so far they've been responsive. Um, we'll see where, where it leads to. See, we have a kind of a different type of system. We don't have immigration data in that sense because people don't usually come to the country and say, I apply to be an immigrant, will you accept me? Um, it's a very big kind of de political debate right now, and Australia is being flagged by the anti-immigration people <laughs> as an example of how we should regulate things. And, and of course, you need to, you know, no offense, um, <laughs> we need to, you need to see it in context. Um, we have, of course, a system where people come into the country um, through three channels. The first is freedom of movement within the European Union. That's the main. So most of the immigration in the last uh, 15 years has been through people who technically are not immigrants. They simply move from Queensland to Victoria. You move from Poland to, in to Britain. It's the same kind of level. Um, so they may or may not register for school places or for a doctor surgery, and you may or may not know that they have now moved from Lithuania to, to Scotland. Um, but, you know, that's freedom of movement. That's, that's the main movement. Um, there's people who've been in the country for several generations. Otherwise, there's refugees. So there's people coming from, from African countries now, mainly from the Middle East recently, uh, as well, previously Bosnian, Vietnamese, and so on, who had refugee status. They apply for refugee status. And so there is, yeah, there are statistics when they're granted, if they're granted refugee status. And then there's a tiny minority of kind of oligarchs who come and have a lot of money. They usually go to London. They don't come to Manchester, so we don't have to worry about them um, usually. Uh, but, but otherwise, there, there isn't a kind of a point system where you apply, can I be an immigrant? Yes, you can. And, and that's kind of captured in the data. Um, so the census really gives us all of those data, um, again, to the extent that we can rely on them. We get language, country of birth, when did you arrive in the country? and so on. So, so we can basically derive the immigration data from the secondary data, um, uh, but we don't actually have data on are you or are you not an immigrant and, and when directly. 